I, I swear to God, it's They're a high def camera. Right, but but some of them are just like look yeah. like look look like somebody has you bought it the vas five and dime. Yeah, Vaseline John, and smudged it over open? the lens. <laughs> is this door open? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's get you, that. You can kind of guess there's something behind you, but you're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> is that a bush or, 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 Bu or a Buick? <laughs> Oh, Carmen's there. Yeah. So you just got back from what? Lincoln Corsair? That's probably embargoed, right? Is that the, that's the compact. <clears throat> MKC. Yeah. But it looks better, right? I didn't think, I thought the last one was good looking. This one looks better to me. You think? I thought. But yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, what, is, what, is, what is, one of the things that is really amazing about that car to me is, is the fact when they, they talk about the S-curve that they put in the design, you know, you think, ah, S-curve in the design, sure thing. And uh, so the, the program, because I was with Phelan and the, and the uh, um, program director says, no, 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 come on, you gotta, you gotta touch this thing. And I oh mean, my. and you just, you go on the Sensual. door. And I mean, it, it literally, the body stamping yeah. is, which is hard to do. I mean, do. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. You, know, you normally get a bunch of folds. Right. But, <laughs> but you try and do that but stuff. But this, I mean, and, and the thing of it is, is that if you see it in the right light, also. It's, it's visible. Cool. But otherwise, it's, it's not obtrusive. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't look corny. So the question mm -hmm. becomes, are they talking to themselves? Are they exciting themselves? I mean, is it a customer-centric change, which no doubt was expensive to pull right. off? I mean, do, do they get the value out of it in terms of Great question. customer really Great seeing that question. and loving it? Well, right. but see, maybe they're... Oh, let me point this out to you. Maybe, okay, well. Maybe, maybe they're saving because remember they made a big deal out of the, the hydroformed um, tailgate hatch. Yeah. And, you know, saying it was, the, it was the biggest, yeah. you know. And, Again. Uh, and, well, but, you know, they made a lot about it then and now. <laughs> they've gone back to the old way. Well, it's, it's, st it's still more clamshell than, than <laughs> ordinary, but they've got, they've got a new, a different process, which right, apparently right. is more economical. Yeah. So maybe yeah. they took that money and put it in the body side. So trust me on this. Sometimes everybody's just talking to themselves. No, that's true. And, and you asked the right question. Are you going to get value? Uh, will the customer see value? Can I charge you more because of Exactly. You see, but got a maybe roof, roof when you saw it, and you didn't know why it was subliminal. And you thought, wow, that looks better than the old one. That Maybe. Counts. That counts. See? You, know, you could be a marketing guy. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> or in PR. Yeah. Perceived value spin, is, spin, how spin. do you quantify that? Yeah. It's very hard to do. Well, how do you differentiate the cars these days? They've all got so many blings and lines and angles and garbage on them. And hmm. God, I can't tell. Well, you know, part. Jack Telnack made a great point. He said, you know. I love uh, Jack. Eagles and hawks and parakeets and all, they're all birds, but they look very different. <laughs> yeah. Now, they all got beaks and no, no ears and wings, and, yeah, well, but they uh, all look very different. I don't know. They're getting in such crazy angles and, and protrusions on tail lights and these bulbous headlight covers now that look like warts on the front end. <laughs> yeah. for aerodynamics, whatever happened to that? See, but there's, 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 there's difference between birds, but if we were to take sparrow, the sparrow family at large, right? They may look different in very subtle ways, which goes to your point. They basically are very similar, but they're all the same. Hey, uh, uh, hold that thought, because we can start the show officially as of right now. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. And by DIA MTS, for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us on After Hours. Especially you, Gary. It's great to have you back here in the seat. Good to see you. So, you know, I, I know we're having a somewhat historic show for part of 
today's uh, presentation. And right. So I thought, gosh, something must have happened historical today. And it turns out that today in 1920, Ford announced the name of the Ranger. So the Ranger truck was named in 1920 on this day. What? 1920? There was no Ranger. They named the name, though. They came out and they had this idea. That's what I read. A Model T-based truck or Model A-based? Really? <laughs> Boy, this I got to look up to or look up. And that voice you just heard is Jack Keebler, who's joined us again. It does sound familiar. Ranger does sound familiar. I think there was an old model that was named the Ranger. Yeah, but they I named it after but I don't Texas think it was. A, I'm not sure it was a truck. It was the Edsel, I thought. Wasn't there maybe. an Edsel Ranger? Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> the Edsel Ranger. But that would have been like, later. That would have been later. Yeah. You said what? Twenty. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah. Could they Almost hundred years ago. For the future. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Which. Brings us to Ken Nelson, back in the studio with us on Autoline After Hours. An orphan car collector, is that a good way to describe you? Right. <laughs> and you've brought this convertible version of a Citroen DS. 21. 21. But this one was a special body one built by Chaperon. Right. Right? Tell us a little bit about who the heck was Chaperon and what were they doing cutting tops off cars. He was a French coach builder uh, who did a lot of uh, small volume cars for different manufacturers back in that day. Uh, I don't know who you'd relate that to today. Some like the old Rolls Royce sure. uh, body manufacturer companies. You'd buy a whole chassis and you'd order. Labourde, Fagoni and Falashi. Right, yeah. right. LeBaron. LeBaron, certainly. And he was the only one supposedly doing any of the modifications for the Citroens. Hmm. So, how many of these convertibles were actually made? I, I mean, yours is the only one I've ever seen, except for others in pictures. The number I've always heard is, is 1,300. So, extremely rare car. Right, right. And when was this one made? This was a 1967, and the way they did it was... He and, would and they get, were made from, like, 60 to 71? Does um, that sound right? I've got a 63, and I think they go back as early as maybe 1960. Right. But I'm not too clear on that. <clears throat> a lot of changes. I mean, they take a sedan and they turn it into a two-door convertible? Right. They, they got the platform without the greenhouse, the roof and the pillar structure and so on. And then he cut it down. He made his own, uh, what I call a turtle deck, the back shell area, uh, of about five pieces brazed together, hmm. and formed and then brazed together, and put on a, an understructure tied to the, the standard sedan or later wagon platforms because the wagon had an extra layer of sill metal for stiffness. Okay. Yeah. So they made 1,300. Supposedly. How many survive? It, it's got to be even <laughs> uh, way less than that. Good question. I've, I've never seen a count there, but supposedly if I learned a little French and talked to the uh, French club members, they've got that data somewhere. Hmm. So apparently it was like he'd been a custom builder and then after the custom cars in France were taxed out of existence that he got together Citron and began to make these, these vehicles. And so the Citron would, would ship to his body studio. And white, cut down. The body right. and white. And, and right. so Bare chassis. Uh, it's, it's basically a flat platform. I've got a picture showing how they take the entire upper structure supporting the roof and the pillars, and they drop it on this platform of box sections, unibody, and stitch it together around the perimeter. And therein lies a major flaw for the convertibles, uh, because you take the roof off that car and it loses a lot of stiffness. Mm -hmm. And there's a section between the bottom of the A pillar, the front door hinges, and the wheel well, which is not a true box section, hmm. which I fixed. So it was a U channel before? Or? It was oh, sort of a wide open C section. <laughs> okay. It goes from a perfect box uh, from underneath the uh, hinge pillar all the way to the rear, about two inches wide and seven inches deep. It's a good strong box, hmm. but then it ends. Uh, almost where the cut line is between the fender dog leg and the door. It's and strange. The, 
the, the hood shape is very interesting on this vehicle. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it a front hinged hood or a rear hinged? Rear hinged, but a beautiful factor about it is it can open absolutely vertically and they've provided two little holes in the hinge where you can stick a U-shaped piece of quarter inch steel rod and hold it there. Which means so if you want to work under the hood, you got the oh, whole open area. It's right. fabulous. Plus, if you're a fool like I was one day and <laughs> forgot to uh, latch the, the hood and wrapped it over the roof, oh. <laughs> you can still see where you're going <laughs> because oh, of the my. curvature. <laughs> Did it break the windshield? Did not. It's aluminum, which saved the windshield. Huh. It's a one piece. It's probably one of the largest aluminum stampings ever made. Yeah. You were talking about uh, how you, much structure you lose on s the sedan by removing the roof. So Dan Neal, who we all know, wrote in to say, Chapron DS is one of my top three all time. Did you already cover torsional rigidity? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but I was told, um, and this goes back to a, <clears throat> a personal experience from a Citroen engineer who visited me in Detroit years ago after I'd put the car back on the road. We went over a double set of railroad tracks, and he said, your dash doesn't move around. And I was in a car a friend built, bought out of a junkyard, and as we drove it to his home for restoration, the whole front end of the car was wobbling in front of us. And we so that sort of factory spec is the uh, the wobbly one, right? Uh, well, so your changes maybe provide a little more structure. Oh, absolutely. That's right. why I did it. I'd had enough experience right. fixing someone else's convertible for them and repairing my own rusty sedans um, to know what was missing, and right. it was the end of the box section underneath the door pillar. Hmm. But that was done for the manufacturing process of a of a pinch welder going through an access hole down in the outer panel, which once it goes straight to the door pillar, then the outer wall flops sideways about 30 degrees, and you lose the box. So in my case, this car was so rotten when I got it, it, it was beyond restoration. I found a, a donor car from California with a very solid <laughs> chassis. I cut open the the section where the deficiency is, made up a two-side galvanized 18-gauge plate from rear all the way through that empty area in the front to the firewall, and MIG welded it in. And that's basically made it the strongest one in the world, to my knowledge. Now, this isn't the only one you have. You've got another one of these, right? Another convertible? Yes. Wow. A 63 which is the old brake fluid system, and it's a Citromatic, which has this, what I think of Automatic as, transmission? No, no, no. I, I, Automatic manual transmission. I call it the first <laughs> paddle shifter, although I've been argued against by a lot of oh. people in the club. The fact is you could flick from one gear to another with a fingertip while your hand is still on the wheel. Cool. It's all hydraulically controlled. It controls the gear and the clutch at the same time. And yeah, somebody else had something like that, didn't they? Not Wilson pre-selectors. Yes, things Wilson, like that. that's what I was thinking. Ah, but that was a two operation. You had a stock with a bunch of little tiny levers you flicked, but then you had to take your yes. foot off the clutch right. to actuate it. This is totally all in one. Hmm. One movement does everything. And cool. I got to believe that's the first ever. So I got to tell you, I was having <clears throat> lunch earlier this week with one of the designers in town, and he was saying, so who you got coming on Autoline After Hours uh, this Thursday and everything. And I mentioned we we're going to have Ken, and he's going to have his Chaperon DS. And the guy said, oh, that's about a $400,000 car. I said, well, this is not Concours, you know. <laughs> th th this one's, it's seen a lot of miles. And he said, oh, then it's only worth 300000 Is that what this car's worth? And I only insured it with Haggerty for seventy-five. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I'm going to have to increase Underinsured. That. Yeah, yeah. So you may be sitting on a couple of fairly valuable cars. Uh, well, I liken it. Uh, in fact, I believe, and for a lot of good reasons, that this has to be the most innovative automobile ever designed. Why? Just the DS in general, not necessarily the convertible. but Oh, just, yes, the DS. Yeah, the they're DS. amazing. In October of 55, when they introduced it in Paris, it blew the world's minds. And... The history says that they actually took 12,000 orders the first day of the show, and at the end of the week, they had 80,000 orders. They'd sold out the next five years' production. 
I don't. I got a lot of manufacturers would like to have that problem. I yeah. got to believe that's a record. Yeah, that's got to be. I'd love to verify that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, a couple of other comments from the the audience. Our work says a French convertible Colombo would love. <laughs> oh, of or worse. Yeah. Better than this Peugeot. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> South Carolina Osprey says, looks like that car could be used in uh, a Hollywood or foreign movie. Goes on to ask, parts availability? Who repairs these? Engine and horsepower. Engine, 2100 cc for the second 10 years of the production, 1900 for the first. As far as parts, <clears throat> the beauty of this car is very little was changed over the 20 year spread. Hmm. On a sedan, you can replace the rear bumper, the roof, the rear fenders, all four doors, all the glass over those 20 years. Same. Only the front end changed. <coughs> and there they went to quad headlights in 68. And in 66, they made a major, major powertrain change to a five main bearing engine with an actual oil filter. Uh, they beat what a the, concept. Yeah. Well, 57 Chevys didn't have it filters, did they? What were they using prior to the oil filter? There was no filter? No filter, just a screen on the pump. I guess you need to just change your oil pretty regularly, huh? Well, the thing that I think everybody did back then was they built slinger traps in the crankshaft, crankshaft itself. These cranks have a hex plug you can unscrew and clean out the gallery where the centrifugal force oh my. Uh, centrifuges the junk out. Ken, you said when you got the car it was beyond restoration. Yeah, I heard that too. So, so, so my question but is, how'd you get it here? And, and what, what, what all did you have to do to what we see here? Long story short, I got it in 82 from two friends from the old Chicago club. They were hoping I could restore it. When I got into it and found out how much fiberglass had been slathered over rusty, <laughs> lacy metal, hmm. I said, and I'd already taken it apart to find out what it needed. And I said, I'm uh -oh. afraid I've destroyed it. Yeah. Uh, so I basically bought them out. I sent them a video of all the pieces on my garage floor in West Bloomfield. And I've got a whole loose leaf here full of pictures of, of the, the awful mess. The rear suspension cylinders have blown themselves into the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I got it here from Chicago by putting a transverse leaf spring from a junk car between the two rear axles with chain loops to the eyes on oh the spring, reinforced the trunk so to take it, and dollied it back with the a Saab starter motor driving the hydraulic pump for the front end, which I sealed off from the rear. And it made it beautifully. Wow. Now, and you can go ahead and tool down the highway at 70 miles an hour in this car. Well, how about 90? <laughs> how about 90? Yeah, I like that. Long story short, 82. 89, 1,200 hours over seven years. Wow. Just to put a decent chassis under it. And I, by that time, I was so tired, I forgot the aesthetics. <laughs> you mentioned that the hood is aluminum. Yes. What are the rest of the body panels? Sheet metal, about a millimeter thick. And, and were the body panels destroyed that when you, when you received the vehicle? Well, the, uh, the door bottoms still need replacing. They're half fiberglass. I had to make the sills underneath the doors my, by myself. There was nothing left there. Mm. Uh, the rear body, I fixed a few things, but it's got also fiberglass and rust there. The front, front fenders are pretty much shot. I patched them together, so I'm looking for a new set. Um, but the structure is solid. And the neat thing about these cars was when they were first built, it was a totally drivable platform with not a single body panel on the car. Hmm. And Fiero copied the idea. Hmm. What, what I was wondering about is, is that, was the hood in good shape? Yeah. So, it's so aluminum. Right. So, so basically right. the argument for non-ferrous materials being utilized for body panels is right good. in front of us. <laughs> well, don't get me started on my, on my all aluminum 1954 Panard, where the entire four-door, five-passenger sedan body shell weighed 220 pounds. And Detroit, I kept hearing when I came out here 30 plus years ago, you can't weld aluminum. The French were doing it in 54. Well, you can do a lot of other things to it. You can rivet it. You can glue it. Glue it, yeah. So. Hey, we're going to 
Be back in a moment to talk more about this Chapron, very rare car. But first, a shout out to Bridgestone, who makes this show possible. Okay, we're back talking all about this uh, Chapron DS21 convertible. We got a couple of comments here uh, to, uh, here's a guy called Let's Get Very Drunk, who says, what a marvelous car. Does this one have the road following headlamps? No, that was added in uh, 68 when they went to quad headlights. Explain I'll... that a bit for those who don't okay. know this. Well, actually, I heard that in France, the single headlight cars, the first design, actually did rotate, but I've never seen one to confirm that. It's hooked to the steering gear some way? Right. Uh, in 68, when they went to quad headlights, they connected a cable between the rear roll bar and the headlights for attitude. Hmm. Wow. To correct. But the big deal was the outer, the, let's see, I forgot what's the inner or outer headlights. I think headlights. It's the inner. Inner ones rotate with a steering wheel to light your way around a curve. Hmm. And it really works. They've got some video out there, advertisements, sweeping down 180 degree turns on mountain roads and showing how it lights the way around at night. And of course, we banned it over here. Right. right. And not only that, it, it took the industry, what, about another 30 years to catch up to that with what they call AFS headlamps that right. do turn with the steering. Right. But Citroen had it in a long time ago. Well, there is a car back from the teens or so that all actually had that too as a feature with some uh, uh, steel rod controls, mm -hmm. right. but it never went big volume. Didn't the Tucker have the ability to... Uh... Center headlight, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. 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 and it, it also right. followed the road. Yeah. So it's not an original idea, but as a production vehicle, this really established uh, the idea. You need to talk a little bit about the, uh, the suspension system on this vehicle. It's oh. pretty unusual. In fact, you got a, a show and tell item that we got to pull out. Right. For okay. It is the only car in the world short of lowriders. In fact, it is the original lowrider. It is. <laughs> uh, which gave the Chicanos the idea. With a totally hydraulic suspension, there's not a steel spring in the suspension except the anti roll bars. Uh, the springs are actually nitrogen gas filled spheres, one of which is right here screwed together, machined out of forged steel, holds 900 PSI nitrogen, filled in through here, um, and the rears are pressurized to 400 PSI. I refill them in my garage. Yeah, just hold it there, because we got a camera on it yeah. right now. So this is what, machine steel, cast steel? What is that? Two pieces of what must be forged steel, but they're totally machined inside and out, and they have a sawtooth thread here to take the incredible stress on that screw joint. But you can, Take them apart and rebuild them and put in another diaphragm like this, which replaces the rubber inside when it ever leaks, if it does. Hmm. And the, um, this sits on top of basically a hydraulic jack on each wheel with a push rod coming out the bottom of the cylinder. So there's fluid in between the piston and the sphere end and the spheres actually have built-in shock absorbers that never wear out. All right, this one is missing one. This, this has an early screw-in type, which you can actually play with yourself. You can take it apart and change the tiny spring discs, which control the change flow rate. The damping rate. Huh? Yeah, you can play with it. So there's 950 PSI of nitrogen. Yes. And that's in the front, and uh, the right. rears are slightly less pressure. 400, right. 400 loads. PSI. Right. And then you've got oil pumping through this, this lower part that right. you just showed us. Um, a 3 16 line feeds high pressure up to 1,000 PSI or so through here into the, between the piston and the sphere, and that's what supports the car. And what everybody should know, so when you start up a, a DS like this, after a moment or two, the whole body rises right. as the oil pressure builds in these four corners. Yes. So it's totally suspended on basically a hydraulic jack on each suspension arm with a gas spring on top, no steel. Mm -hmm. does, does the, the, you mentioned the diaphragm can be replaced. Yes. Is, is, is it a one-piece diaphragm or is there another half? No. 
Well, this is it. This sits, imagine this is off the car. The diaphragm sits trapped in a groove inside here. It's sandwiched between the upper half and the bottom half. The nitrogen is on this side, pushing against the sphere top. So this is pressed against the um, opening here. And as soon as you hide, uh, pump hydraulic pressure in, the fluid forces the diaphragm back and compresses the gas to an even higher pressure. And that's your spring. Hmm. It's compressed gas. Is there any adjustment inside the car as far as the ride height? And Absolutely. You, okay. This is the only car with uh, an automatic self-leveling system, regardless of load, front or rear. There's a height control valve uh, connected to the anti-roll bar, very much like Packard had an electric load leveling motor mm -hmm. that winched up the rear suspension back in the 50s. So you put a heavier load in the car. It moves the roll bar, which controls a valve, which is damped, and it'll add more fluid to pump the car back up to normal driving height. So does the ride character change at all, or the damping rate change? It'll stiffen, because okay. now you've increased the pressure versus the load, but it's still the most fantastic. Still comfortable, yeah. Oh, it's the most fantastic ride in the world. One of my favorite stunts is if somebody's following me hard on my tail down a, a neighborhood road with speed bumps, I'll go over the bump at 40 miles an hour, and they'll bang off the roof. <laughs> That's one way to... Does, does the nitrogen leak out at all? It can. Um, if a diaphragm is uh, fed the wrong fluid hmm. that can affect the material, it can leak, it can dissolve, crack, whatever. So there are specific fluids for the different models of the cars. But I, I, let me just jump in. They'll hold that pressure for years, for decades even, right. hmm. if everything's running right. I was shocked when I bought a car in 1971, which had been built in 1959, and I sold it about five years ago. I said, I'd had it 35 years, and I checked the pressure in the spheres. They had these brake fluid back then, not DOT-3 and an ethylene propylene rubber. The sphere still held 800 PSI versus the 900 initial. I was surprised. So did anybody uh, license this suspension system for any other vehicles? Rolls. Yeah. Rolls-Royce used it, yeah. Yes, they use it for the rear suspension leveling. Until the late 70s. Right. Mm -hmm. But just the rear of the car, huh? Mercedes did also. Huh, for the 600s? Not the 600s, they were full air. Okay. But I think on some of their cars, they licensed it too. Mm. So it works. Yeah. The amazing thing about the car is that uh, I met a GM exec engineer when I was visiting Delco once in the 80s. And somehow we got onto Citroens. And he said that in 57, he and another exec bought a 57 DS19, just been introduced, and had their teams cost analyze it. Sort of like their Mona Lisa Center over in uh, right. Warren. Tore it down, came back, and the team said, are uh, you sitting down? Uh, yeah. For GM to build the car in 1957 would have cost them $10,000. Wow. And it was selling for? maybe a couple thousand or less. I, I really don't know the prices back then. So it's great to have a French government owning a part of the company and funding cars that lose money. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's because it was a loss leader for Michelin because Michelin owned the company huh. and they sold their radials on it. In fact, it was a very specific size radial that didn't fit anything else. It Wait a, a minute, Michelin owned Citroen? Yes. I never knew this. 1935. Andre Citroen had gone bankrupt at uh, Monaco and died of whatever, and Michelin was the biggest creditor. Hmm. They took it over. Hmm. How long did they own it? I, probably until Peugeot bought them out in, uh, oh, what was it, the 80s? Something like that. Sounds right. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, I still to this day do not understand how the devil the engineers at Citroen got away with this car. Anybody else would have shut them down. Yeah. Because it was so over-engineered. Well, yeah, but there are reasons. Uh, people, this is the only car in the world I know of that has every suspension arm mounted in not rubber bushings, tapered roller bearings <laughs> that never need service. I have never greased one in 57 years. They're that well sealed. And they, I finally figured out why they did that. Imagine now you've got a car with 10 inches of travel. You can practically off-road these things. And go anywhere. If you tried to get a rubber bushing to move that through that angle, especially with long trailing arms in the rear over two feet long, and you get any slop, you're all over the road. Right. 
only a roller bearing can keep it that precise, that controlled, and never deteriorate. Hmm. How many people have to rebuild the rubber bushings on their other European cars or American cars? Hmm. They never wear out. When, when this car went out of production, did all of those suspension innovations go with it? No. They carried over in the uh, CX, which was the next model that replaced it. It had a transverse front engine instead of a longitudinal mid-engine. And they still had the hydraulics. They still had the bearings on the suspension arms for control. All they did was make a separate semi-ladder chassis with rubber bushings to keep the road noise down a little bit more. And that was it. Otherwise, uh, it had all the basic original features. Hey, we're getting down to the end of the segment. Daniel wants to know, what kind of fail-safes or redundancies did they implement in the suspension? Uh, well, not much. <laughs> when you're flat and you've, you've hemorrhaged all the fluid out or whatever, you're down on rubber bump stops. Hmm. And that's happened to me. Hmm. So uh, you keep rolling at low speed? Oh, you can crawl, yeah. yeah. That's if you have a manual. If you have the Citromatic hydraulic shift, you're dead in the weeds. <laughs> yeah, because, and that's a good thing to point out, the, the brakes, the power steering, the automatic transmission and the suspension all ran off the same fluid system. The oh, only really? car with a central system, which Detroit has talked about for years but never done. Huh. For obvious reasons. <laughs> hey, another quick question here. South Carolina Osprey wants to know, how many miles do you drive a year on this thing? Uh, not that many because I've got too many cars. But in one trip, <laughs> five weeks in 1994, my son a and I drove it. Have. Over five weeks, I drove it 8,000 miles from Detroit, mm -hmm. Vancouver, Pacific Northwest, Death Valley in August, 118 wow. degrees in Furnace Creek, wow. back to Detroit at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> All right, I've, I've got to ask, I mean, this is a convertible. Was there anything innovative about the way it retracts? No. It's manual, right? It's not hydraulic. <laughs> no, it's not. Ma it's, it's manual, but it's right. counterbalanced with springs versus my Pinard convertible, which is a pain in the you-know-what to get mm -hmm. up. It takes two people. Mm -hmm. And it should be pointed out, this is the original top to the car. It oh, is. wow. It is the same top as when I first learned about this car in 1967. So only the aluminum and the canvas survived. <laughs> well, the body. <laughs> the undercarriage didn't. I mean, is, could you find a top if you need one? Well, their top shops can duplicate anything. Okay. Okay. Just takes money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, look, we're going to have to wrap this up, but, Ken, it's always fun to have you on the show. You always bring something unusual, you know, <laughs> cars that nobody else in the world has or, or very few people do. I just like to play automotive archaeologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's really good. Well, look, uh, we're going to take a, a break right now. We're going to be back with Joe McCabe in just a minute, but we've got two sponsor messages that we're going to get to. Whether they're electric, autonomous, or connected, tomorrow's cars must be developed quickly with the highest precision, and they have to be lightweight. DIA MTS can provide what you need, from advanced manufacturing machinery to lightweight components. Learn more at our website at www.d-iamts.com or visit our showroom right next to Metro Airport in Detroit. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. Okay, we're back, and we got Joe McCaig from Auto Forecast Solutions with us. Hey, John, good to see you again. Good, good, good to have you, you back on the show. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Joe. So we got all kinds of things to talk about, but I know Gary's got some issues uh, that we need to talk about in the news, right? Or you want to kick off with that, or what? Well, we could we could on that road to uh, to begin with. Um, we're, we're looking at uh, an innovative European car here earlier. Um, it seems that the Euros and diesels are continuing to be a problem um, with um, the prosecutors in Germany bringing suit against um, former um, chairman of, of Volkswagen, Martin Winterkorn, um, current chairman, uh, Dr. Herbert Diess, and uh, the 
former chairman of the supervisory board, Hans Dieter Poch, um, for alleged market manipulation for not revealing the problem with the diesel. Then we also have Mercedes Benz, actually Daimler, being uh, charged $960 million as a settlement with German prosecutors for their gaming of diesels. Okay, so, so what? And you, one more. FCA. FCA. <laughs> yeah. Just had their, what, head of calibration or something yes. like that for diesels get, was he indicted? He, he was, was arrested. Indicted. I mean, they put this guy in handcuffs. Yeah. All right, so here's my question to you guys. Okay, so the scandal broke here in 2015, right? Yeah. Here we are at the tail end of 2019. I mean, when does this end? Uh, hopefully sometime soon because, I mean, obviously Volkswagen wants to get back on its feet. A lot of uh, activity going on there with electric cars moving away from the diesels. Uh, I mean, you could say they're, they're hiding the trail or they're moving on to, you know, better things, but obviously uh, uh, there, there are still a lot of issues concerning diesels. I mean, you know, we mentioned just a couple of other manufacturers. You know, uh, there have been a number of manufacturers that have had diesel issues. I mean, I'm not going to bring up the names now. But, uh, you know, p part of the problem was, you know, th they were offered these opportunities to turn the system on and off to preserve the, you know, the fluid, to preserve the system itself. And I, the problem was they sort of took, you know, too much advantage of those opportunities. I mean, Bosch has also gotten themselves, you know, kind of mixed up their, in this, their too. Neck in this. Right. But to get to your, your question there, Gary, which is a good one, I'm stunned that revelations are still coming out. You know, hmm. the, the, the wheels of justice grind slowly. So if, if something's in court and it's getting appealed, and all, it, it wouldn't surprise me that four years later that would still be happening. But we're still learning about new cases on yeah. this. And even worse, just what, in the last week or two, Volkswagen's been accused of doing the same thing on gasoline engines, both Volkswagen and Audi. Hadn't heard about that. Yeah, no, they had uh, been able to bump up their uh, fuel economy by a mile per gallon by having cheating software that was recognizing when the vehicle was being tested and it would change uh, the shift points on the car. So uh, who knows what's still out there? I'm stunned that VW and Audi, the whole group, didn't just come clean back in 2015 and said, here's all the stuff we've been cheating on. It's still dribbling out. So who knows when it's going to end? I'll tell you, John, when I first heard about this, I didn't believe it because I knew how large the fines were going to be. And I thought, you know, no reasonable company, you know, with, with good senior management would let itself fall into this, call it a mental trap of going down that road. It's just, it's too, it's to tangle the web. Okay, what, what, what impact, if any, will this have on Volkswagen's mm. reputation as it tries to get to this electric future? I've heard people say they're not gonna buy them. Because of this? Right. Yeah, I think that'll go by the wayside. I, actually, I wanna ask Joe, you're the mm. forecaster. Yeah. Is this the end of diesel engines, except for maybe in full-size pickups? I, you know, I, I think I still believe the diesel buyer buys it because it's a diesel. They're not buying it for any kind of fuel economy standards and things like that, or emission standards like talk about. They like the fuel economy. But there's rarely a diesel buyer going, that's, you know, how dare you Volkswagen, I bought this because this was cleaner than everyone else. No one does that. Well, Volkswagen. there was a few. So, there was actually yeah. a few. There was okay. a, probably, um, that was probably the minority yeah. of the Volkswagen right. buyer. Given they painted clean diesel on the sides of many um, of these things. Yes. I mean, right. I think it was easier to justify, hey, that's my car. I wanted that anyway. You know, diesel has a bad uh, indication from years past. I'm now a diesel owner. I like this thing. Look, it's clean. Okay, we'll give you a bump. Then you're doing something good for the environment. But they were, they were buying it because they wanted the torque and the fuel economy and things like that. Does Auto Forecast Solutions track diesel sales in Europe? We go down to the production level globally. We have to bake in the sales side of it and yes we are seeing oh, okay so production same thing right yeah. but I mean, we're seeing a drop in it but you, you know john we, you know we're we are conserving on electrification there's a sticky little thing called a consumer and a shareholder that have to play <laughs> into the mix and every time we talk about electrification we go we don't see the line of people out there waiting where's my electric car right. you know we have the two comp we have the two areas we have the unicorn of tesla a sports car company that so have to be electric with no profitability and then we have utility plays in electrics, and they're two different beasts, and they're two Joe, different Joe, buyers. Is this just an education problem? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, because people don't know how how they fit into their lives. Maybe they're 
Maybe when, they're a little easier to fit into your life than you may think. When gas is two fifty a gallon, mm. it's a tough sell. Yeah, right. but see, I everybody points that out, and I point out that the United States buys more electric cars than Europe does, which is about the same size market. And guess what? Gasoline six or seven bucks a, uh, a gallon. But in it's Europe. all it's it's a Tesla play. Right, they're all buying the Tesla. So far, it is. I, yeah. I do believe that once you get people in an electric car, they're going to go, "Oh my God, look how smooth it is! Look how quiet it is! Uh, the acceleration is I terrific!" I never stop for gas. I, I never. I can plug in at, at the home. garage. This is great. Look, we had a friend. But, in, but I'm yeah. saying, first you got to get their butts <laughs> in the seat, and they look at the sticker price, and they go, "No way!" That's that. That is the ultimate problem, right? It's all in the wallet, and the manufacturer not making profit on them. See, right. and we right. said before, right, you introduce your technology in the niche vehicles and you get your early adopters. It's been, always been our story. Early right. adopters are willing to spend the premium for that right to own that vehicle. How do you get to a $30,000 or $40,000 electric vehicle that gives you the power you want and then all the other benefits? There aren't a lot of bolt players. I'm not trying to shame any name. I'm just saying if you talk about a utility play of an electric vehicle, Leaf or Bolt, they're great for what they do, but they don't have the go like stink capability like a Tesla. Are they does. the right body style? Because I mean consumers are buying pickup trucks and crossovers. Well, is that so, part of the issue? So we dovetail into Rivian with that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. We dovetail into a pickup truck at Rivian, their SUV, their Range Rover fighter, and now they're soon to be Amazon Mini, they're the Amazon van, right, right. right? And they're filling a niche that no one has filled yet. Bob Lutz said years ago, we made a big mistake. We should have been electrifying trucks the whole way. He backed a horse called Via, right. and Via went nowhere. Well, but, you know, to, to the point of, of diesels and, and electric vehicles, I mean, we're seeing a test case play out right in front of us with Honda basically announcing that, what, 2022, they're done with diesels in Europe. They have a factory in England that builds diesel mm. engines and they're going to stop building those diesel Some engines. Some of that's a they're going to stop developing. <laughs> okay, yeah. developing. I thought they were going to stop building yeah, them. I'd be shocked. It, so and, you got to read the words because it's the development. You can small block three has been around for thirty years. I mean, you can have a block and just keep on putting technology on it. Right. So, so you know, and then we saw in Frankfurt that Honda came out with the cute as a bug e. Honda E mm -hmm. electric vehicle, mm -hmm. which you know they have great hopes for. We were last week um, downtown Detroit seeing the introduction of the uh, hybrid version of the CRV, which is a you know uh, highly electrified version since they're using the engine as a generator. Yeah, range extender. Range mm -hmm. extender. Um, you know, so so here's a company that knows a couple things about powertrain, which is basically seeing. Its future as as being one that is more electric than petroleum based. And then the other side of that coin is Toyota, grandparents of electrification with the Prius, easy adopter would be a slam dunk to say now we're the EV players. And they yeah. said nope, we're going fuel cells. And they're a very conservative global company. And when Toyota didn't make that absolute easy leap into electrification, dovetailing off the Prius, uh, we sort of looked at it and go. Okay, we got to really back up and see what, what's building this market. Are, are they waiting for the solid state battery? Solid state, yeah. And uh, look, is lithium ion going to be the solution? Like, right. we still have to ask, we're in the infancy of this right. whole thing right now. And we have companies like, and I'm not, and like Tesla and Rivian, all of a sudden, o overnight, they build a vehicle. Okay, we believe in it, going, mm. this thing's even tested yet. Now, don't get me wrong, we have, I have a friend who bought a Model 3. He bought it in November, he wanted to pay 50, he bent 65,000. And it, he goes, I love it as much as today as the day I bought it. And one of the first features he showed me was, hey, watch this Easter egg. I can make my passenger seat fart. I go, you know, I don't remember ever showing anyone my car. And the first thing I shows an Easter egg is that I, I can push a button and my passenger, you know, it sounds like they fart in that. But he was all narrowed by these really cool over-the-air things and really cool little gadgets. And I'm like, it goes like stink. And I put an autopilot and I let go of my hand and the double yellow ended and went right into oncoming traffic. It's okay, time to, you know. So it's still got his little issues, mm. but we have a 5% penetration rate of pure battery electric by 2026 globally. Now that doesn't Ooh, include globally. Globally, that does include uh, PEVs, P PHEVs. That includes hybrids, right? It's pure battery electric. Okay. So let's say we're wrong. Let's say it's 10%. Let's say it's 20%. Still means 80% of every vehicle in the world still needs an internal combustion engine. So to turn that, you know, I'm looking at this as not as a light switch moment. I'm looking at it as a rheostat moment. 
we're going to slowly be dialing in this EV strategy. Someone's going to make it work. Mm -hmm. I still believe Tesla's the unicorn. I still believe other companies like Rivian who are doing contract manufacturing and are going to start working with the other ones so the Fords and GMs world don't have to make their own investment is going to be the strategy. We also have to drive down the cost of the the battery, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know some of the batteries have very exotic materials inside, which are quite expensive and are in locations in the world where there are problems. Yeah, I mean cobalt alone, right? Yeah. It's uh, you know uh, the Congo, right? Slave la slave labor pulling out of the ground, and these are things that don't process in, in, a, in a buyer's mind when they go buy an electric vehicle. Joe, yeah. one of the things I was wondering about is is that. Okay, this doesn't seem to get as much attention in the auto sphere as, as I think it might. Mm -hmm. That, you know, last Friday, kids from around the world, 150 countries, millions of kids were out processing about the environment. And there isn't a single auto company that I can think of that is basically taking the mantle up of saving, saying, you know, we're in this for envi environmental reasons. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, that very few people buy right. diesels because they're green. But I mean, you see these kids who are completely outraged about environmental conditions around the world. And I'm just wondering whether there might not be a realistic shift sooner rather than later as they're looking at the auto industry and seeing it as not being beneficial. And I thought it was very ironic in this this context was, and to go back to Honda and, and in, in, in this case, so they, they announced today the um, Honda Accord hybrids going on sale tomorrow. And the lead sentence in their news release was featuring best in class horsepower. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. EPA city and combined fuel economy ratings of 48 MPG and standard Honda sensing technology. You know, I mean, it's just like, so they're leading with horsepower. They're not leading, they're not leading with the environment. They have to. But is, yeah. but, they have to now, but I mean, is, is there not the possibility that when you have millions of 16-year-olds becoming 21-year-olds in five years or so, whether those are going to be a new game here? You know, you know, five years from now is one life cycle. So five years from now, and, and you know, play counterpoint to that. I'm not, look, I'm not anti-EV. It's one solution for the future, just not the only solution, right. right? And five years, and we live in a glacial market. That's where we play. Five years, one life cycle. So that means we're going to have to turn this into a mass market $30,000 car to afford all those 21-year-olds to actually go buy that, totally that electrified agree with that. vehicle. Yep. We need to drive the, the, the business case has to make sense. Yeah. And right now, the battery cost is too high. Now, there's a lot of projections, but, you know, what do you believe? But I think Gary raises a really good question because this anger that you see amongst these young mm. people, especially well, the protests at Frankfurt. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it's real. It's Greta genuine. Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. I mean, right. she is one angry teenager. Yes, she is. And I, I think she does represent a generational shift in attitude, mm. but it's colliding with what you're talking about here, Joe. I mean, the price of the batteries isn't coming down for another decade to where it matches mass market ICEs. Right. Yeah, you know, Porsche figured out the, the way you do it. You charge 150000 yeah. up for the right. car, and you can make a profit, and you sell everyone to that clientele. But to bring the cost down to a $30,000 car where you can make profit on it, and I mean good margins, right. to be able to right. invest in the future, we're not there. We're not even close. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're telling GM and Ford and Chrysler that you're going to move away from your money makers of pickup trucks or may have tens of thousands of dollars in the hood, then you've got to convert that to an electrified vehicle that's going to give them tens of thousands of dollars in the hood. And that is past that that is a just a generational shift but it's a generational shift i think where i'll give you an example my kids don't know a pre-cell phone world right they don't know a pre-cd <laughs> road and finally know what a cd is at this point yeah. right so the generational shift has to be literally i grow up there's a plug in my garage what is that dad oh that's for uh pl evs no kidding and my entire youth is this understanding. So I don't know if it's the 16-year-olds. I think they'll push the movement, but it's the five-year-olds. It's the five-year-olds hearing it from the 16-year-olds, and now we're 11 years. Now we're two and three life cycles away because the profitability has to be there. Shareholders will not stand for, I'll see my money in 30 years. Right, and so what I'm wondering about is, is whether the 16-year-olds of today are yep. basically going to say, I ain't buying a car. Hmm. So, so basically, well, they might not but they will take an Uber. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, but again, yes, but, right. So, but again, that will drive the profitability of the car companies down because they're just basically saying no. I guess. I mean, I, you know, when when you get them in a closed space and say, what kind of what kind of uh, 
personal space do you want? What kind of privacy do you want? Do you want to pick up your car keys, whatever they're powering, and get it from point A to point B? Or are you going to rely on your laurel to say, nope, I'm going to save the environment one step at a time. I'm walking where I'm going to go. And they go, well, actually, I need to go from point A to point B. I got to go skiing somewhere. I got to go to my friends somewhere. So I think there is, a, there is this swell in the ground. There's movement. You know, our take on electrification is this. Five years ago, or even 10 years ago, we could have said, people can turn on the switch. Oh, I ran out of money. It's no good. We're going to turn it off. We're going to zero. And all of a sudden, we're seeing this curve. We're never going to see a zero any, ever again in the EV space. But the new baseline is doing this. So when we're all in prosperity, seven, eight years of prosperity, right? And all of a sudden, now we turn and go, now we have a downturn coming in the next couple of years. Call it a recession, call it a downturn, wherever you come. The first place you're going to have to move your money is in the places that are high risk. You've got to put it short up in your fundamentals. And the high risk is the EV investment right this second. Mm. So to make sure we're protected, we're going to have to shift that R&D money now to things that we're good at so we can move the metal so we can pay for that EV in five or ten years. So we're going to see the peaks and the valleys and the peaks and the valleys. But the good news is we're never going to see that zero baseline. We're never going to be the zero BEV anymore. We're going to be constantly growing this vector. And that's what's going to grow it over time. There's going to be a tipping point. I just think that tipping point is, is, is pretty far out there right this second. So I just wonder with the regulations in cities like L L London and yeah. Lisbon and that are saying no cars in time. Right, cities. green zone. Okay. Right. We got to take another quick commercial break. Right. We're going to come back and talk about this, Gary. I know you got other topics that oh, we yeah. got to get into too, but first, a shout out to our good friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts. All delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Okay, we're back. And Gary, I know you got other topics you right. got to get into. So, 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 Joe, you mentioned high-risk investment, and um, it, it seems to me that one of the biggest high-risk investments is in automated vehicles. And we heard this week mm. that that Ford is now moving into Austin, Texas, and beginning to have another test there. And they, they seem to be still, you know, they, 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 they pulled back somewhat from the 2019, we're gonna have the service out there. But- Well, they never said that, GM did. Was it, oh, yeah. Ford Sorry. said 2021. All right. So, you know, they're making the point that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna spread this stuff out. Now, isn't, isn't that the huge risk that these car companies are investing in? And, you know, what's the, I mean, you, you can maybe get an ROI from selling a car, but how much ROI are you going to get from, from what, leasing a AV? Well, you don't want to lease it. You want to be the, the service provider. Okay. So I, I just heard an interesting right. statistic uh, looking at the airline industry. The airline manufacturers, the, the airframe manufacturers, the Boeings and the mm -hmm. Airbuses of the world, mm -hmm. are a $100 billion a year industry. The airlines, the Deltas, the Americans, are a $300 billion a year industry. Mm -hmm. There's way more money mm -hmm. in providing rides than in making them. And that's what uh, automakers are focused on now. This is why GM started with Cruise, why Ford's looking at its own service. They want to be the mobility providers. They don't want to build cars for the mobility providers. Of course, if, if you think about this for a minute, though, if you've got Airbus and Boeing making $100 million, and you've got at least a dozen service providers, Oh, the percentage might work out better to be billing them than providing the service. I mean, I, when I look at AV, though, I look at that, that's a very nice long game for the audience because you can, you can call it anything you want. You can call blind spot is, is autonomy. You can call it bra automated braking or, or active cruise control is some level of autonomy. And as long as you consider always uh, exposing the consumer to it, they're going to want a new vehicle. Right? So right now we're dealing with, there's going to be a glut of used, really good used vehicles on the market in the next couple of years. How are we going to push this new metal and convince people to pay $55,000 for a Wrangler or whatever it is, right? So how am I going to do that? Well, mine has blind spot. It does? Okay, that's not bad. Mine's about active cruise control. And now you're finally adopting pieces of it that it's going to get them to it. You don't have to go, oh, we're AV and go, oh, you're out of your mind. I want my steering wheel. <laughs> that's, that's, that's year 3000 kind of conversation for me for no steering wheel. But it's the getting the little pieces 
getting the money that they can out of that technology because they can squeeze the head, they can make a ton of profitability on that, being early adopters, and then saying the only way I'm gonna get it is I gotta return, I gotta flip my car around every four years, not every eight years. Because hmm. if we had this every eight years and this car's gonna do everything right now, we're gonna have a problem well, moving the metal. Customers are embracing ADAS, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the advanced driver assist systems, not necessarily autonomy. Right. So yeah, the they're, they're, it's kind of the same supplier base, right? I mean, there a lot of the sensor companies, at least, are, are ADAS. Sure. They're supplying the stuff. Continental and Bosch. Exactly. And, and so, I mean, it's a good thing that they're getting the technology out there. They're driving costs down. They're getting more sensitive sensor technology. So it's 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 a nice proving ground for a lot of the stuff you you would eventually use for autonomy. But the jump to you know we you know if you talk about level four or level five autonomy. Uh, the system that's the intelligence behind that, I, I don't get a sense yet that we're, we're, we're even in the ballpark but see, of what we need. This is where I'll argue with you because I think we got to set a, what we're talking about. What's the definition? So right. if you're mm -hmm. talking retail at the dealership showroom, I totally agree with you. That's, that's not even in the 2020s. Probably. So this is self-driving. Self-driving, yeah. I'm yeah. talking level four. But if you want to talk low-speed geofence, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. or even level high four, speed. it's happening right now. Right, right now. Geofence is happening with the, uh, the system that's at General Motors. That system is on the highway. Super Cruise? Super Cruise is 70 right. mile an hour all day long. Right. And, and when you, yeah. and but guess what? The take just rate gotta, on that is very high, even though it's like it's right. packaged with other stuff. It's like a $5,000 option. Right. And I want to say where it's available, the, the take rate's like 30 or 40%. Right. So it comes back to what you were saying, Joe. Yeah. As people get a taste of bits of autonomy, it's mm. like, give me it. I want right. more. Right. right. And, and if you dole it out in just enough pieces, you're going to keep them on because everyone, look, let's keep on coming back to Tesla. There are people investing in a stock and a company doesn't make any profit because they're betting on the come. They're betting on the, what it could be, could be, right? So everyone else is to say, I've been staying at $10 for my the last 20 years of my stock here. How do I convince a consumer I'm, in, I'm investing in the future? You know what? I'm going to invest in this, this really cool stuff that's never going to happen for 50 years to show them it's, it's possible, but each time I'm going to dole out new. You know we're going to have backup cameras are now mandatory. You know we're going to have blind spot and evacuate active crew, alerts. right? All that stuff's going to be mandatory eventually. Where when mm. you're getting your car going, V to V, right? V to V is which is to me is going to be the big breakthrough. That's in right. Safety. I completely agree with that. And we have a major infrastructure right now issue that if you don't keep it geofence, you don't keep in these controlled areas that have no snow and things like that. There's a lot of hurdles. But the fact they're making the investment, they're saying, stick with us, consumer. Stick with us, investor. We're going to be. We're going to get there. You're gonna, and just come for the ride the whole time. We're going to make money the I'm whole time. I'm convinced the consumers are interested in the technology. I guess the, my, my second question would be, are the insurance companies seeing, you know, a reduction in accidents because mm -hmm. of the system? I, I thought I'd read somewhere that maybe the, they are starting to see just the leading edge here's, of that. Here's the problem. The technology is working. It's making cars safer, and as people feel safer, it's like, ah, you know, I got time to make a taxi here. They drive more recklessly. That's eliminating exactly. the advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's that's that. that's kind of what happened with the Tesla stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. if they if they had been using the system the way they're supposed to, eyes on the road, yeah. hands on the wheel, they probably probably wouldn't have had those accidents. It was where somebody was, you know, looking at a an iPad or something. Or sleeping. Right. Or sleeping, and they got I'm telling you, we were, because he goes, try it. My buddy said, try it in city mode. Don't, he goes, try it on highway, not city mode. I go, let's just try. He goes, and I literally was like this. <laughs> Steering wheel's here. And right. when I saw, and it went in, I'm like, oh, man. He goes, yep, doesn't work in the cities yet, because it doesn't understand it. Because, for the Tesla system. For the Tesla, because, but when I'm on a highway, he goes, it will pull my interchange. Wow. It'll, it'll pass a car if it's going too slow and get back in the lane. It is really, really cool technology. So I just don't think there's 20 more Teslas out there. That's the problem. But, but do you think that that technology could be deployed by General Motors and Ford and FCA and so on? I think on? it could be eventually, but Tesla can run by their yeah. own. No, or eventually their is the own right word run. because their lawyers would go, are you crazy? Yeah. We're not putting that on the street now. We're going to get our asses People here. accept the issues with Tesla because that's the work that they're buying because they're in the game early. Yeah. I don't think... People are going to accept that from a mainstream established manufacturer. They expect a little more out of it. I don't think GM does beta testing. Right. Not with their consumer. Yeah, right. Yes. No. Right. Hey, we got uh, more topics to get to before we run out. Well, I mean, here. Um, here we are in day 11 of the UAW strike. Mm. Um, I read some things that you had to say about that, which I think you should share with the, with the greater audience. Well, I've, I've, I've written a lot and reported a lot this year. Look, uh, from the very beginning, I've said this is going to go two weeks. Why? because the rank and file don't trust their leadership. Why? Because of all the corruption charges. And so if the leadership was to come 
you know, two weeks ago and say, hey, look, just before the contract expired, we got a new one, rank and file would say, we don't trust you guys. You right. sold us out. So they got to show that they're taking GM to the mat and mm -hmm. fighting for the members. Also, it's in the interest of the union leadership to drag this out. Because as soon as these contracts are signed, sealed, and delivered, boom, all eyes are back on the corruption charges. Hmm. Right now, it's solidarity forever. Mm -hmm. You know, Bernie Sanders was in town. Elizabeth Warren was in town. You know, they're working, marching with the workers. You notice, none of the leadership is out marching with these guys and gals. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think it's going to get resolved mm -hmm. this weekend. Mm -hmm. I'll bet it's very, very close to what GM put on the table just before the contract expired. And yeah, look. Yeah, what, what will that consist of? It, they're going to get more money. They, you know, it's time to raise the, their well, they base. They're going to get a vehicle. They're going to get the truck, right? So they're putting the BT1. It's where we have the platform code on. The electric electrify. Truck. And we, we're seeing two variants of a pickup and two variants of an SUV at Hamtramck. At, so they'll keep that plan open. Right. But to the union, that's not a win. We had that plan anyway. That's right. You just turned so it back. So all you yeah. did is we, we got it back. Zero, That's right. not a win. So right. they're, they're not going to look at it like that. are they also looking for some changes in the temporary worker status? Well, that's, pay? And right. let's that see the details one. come out. So GM's 7% of its hourly workforce in the U.S. are temps. The transplants, mm -hmm. the, the Kias, the Hyundais, the Honda, use about 20%. Hmm. And those people are typically paid about $15 an hour versus the $28 an hour that an all-in UAW guy makes. So what GM is saying is, look, when we have a model launch, a new model launch, we got to staff up. We don't want those people to be full-time because once we get through the launch, we don't need them. Mm. And we need temps for when people go on vacation. Mm -hmm. And it turns out GM has horrifically high AWOL absenteeism, 12% a day at its plants, which to me is completely, totally inexcusable. You know, a typical assembly plant has 2,500 employees hourly. That means 300 people every single day are not showing up for work. And they didn't call you up to say, hey, I'm feeling bad today. I'm not. No, they just don't show up. So they got to be able to staff up for that. I understand that it's it's bad when you're doing work on the line mm -hmm. and the person next to you is doing the exact same job, but you're making 28 an hour, they're making 15 an hour. They're pissed off. I totally understand it. Mm. But the same time, GM has the highest uh, labor costs in the U.S. auto industry. $63 an hour, all in, everything benefits and profit sharing. <sighs> How do you help GM reduce their labor costs? Yeah. You know, how do you address issues like, you know, high levels of absenteeism, work rules and lines of demarcation, especially with skilled tradespeople that makes their costs go up? So what I'm interested in is we're, we're going to hear everything that the union got. What's GM getting out of this? All right. So here's my here's a, here's a basic question. So when when the contracts get signed and they go back to work, what is the relationship going to be like between the UAW and General Motors? Well, look, you know, it's not like this is the first time it's ever happened. It's been a long what, time since it's happened, though. It, it, yeah, on a strike like this. Right. But there's contract negotiations every four years, and every four years, the leadership gets the rank and file all riled up and angry at the company. And then it goes back to normal again. You know, it, things will simmer down, and in a year from now, if you go talk to any of those UAW people, you'll find amazingly loyal to the company. Oh, yeah. Believe in the product that they make. Believe in the company. But every four years, they get all riled yeah. up because they, God damn it, they want more money. <laughs> it's going to go from $250 a week right now to back to full pay. Right. So I think they're going to feel a little more... Uh, relief? Yeah, a little more relief at that point. <laughs> so, so what kind of a hit are they going to take in terms of... Production. production. So, you know, we look at the inventory numbers all the time, right? If the cynic in me says, great way to pull down the inventory numbers, you know, settle, settle some things, you know, set all your books out a little bit. Um, for GM, we, GM came in at um, 3.16 last year million, and they're going to come in at 3.1. So we're talking about not a huge blip, 
because they've been pumping. I mean, I, we, no, you know our weekly really report. Yeah. Our weekly report. No, I like it's overtime. I, yeah, right. Every single. I mean, it's we can't pipe. You know, we're running on ink. We type overtime. So I mean, we there's overtime every single week for the last several months. Now that if that was just prepping for the inevitable here or not, but we have a lot of a lot of stuff in the pipeline that if they come back. I think they'll be back right on track. We're probably looking at about a 50,000-unit deficit from last year hmm. at just GM, not anything substantial. Yeah, and the, the market's a little bit, you know. I, yeah, yeah it's, a ton of, it's still a ton of product, right? right. They're still moving a lot of metal. All right. Hmm. So speaking of General Motors, um, th this is something that you've talked about a lot, and I, I just find this interesting. So they announced, GM announced today they're putting Alexa in vehicles. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, they announced they were putting Google Voice Assistant right. in vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, isn't this a situation where they have basically come to the conclusion that, you know, consumers really want to use brands that they're familiar with from their home existence rather than some development that came out oh, of... It's Absolutely. CarPlay and Android, right? Yeah, Every, look. They don't pick. They said, we don't want you to have to choose us or not choose us because we don't have it. Right. right. So we'll give it all to you. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, the auto industry just lost the war. Yeah. You think that's mm -hmm. a good point, John. In, in, in terms of this, yeah, because, you know, General Motors has had OnStar. That was going to be their whole communication system. Right. If you look at Toyota, they had, what is it called, Entune, yeah. I think. And Toyota was like, no way in hell are we letting Google and Apple in our cars, you know, because they want to be able to control it. And as soon as Google and Apple are in, they got access to all the data, which is where the real money is. Right. The auto industry just lost this war. You don't think they're, they're taking a little bump off that, that shared knowledge that Amazon and Google are going to pull out? Be great to know. They don't, they don't share the of details of their contracts. But there's got to be the, some, you know. Some. You know, our job is eventually we want to go autonomy. So tell me what, when they pass past that Starbucks every 10 seconds, and you're tracking, they're talking, they're saying in that car, we need to follow that back to us. Right, but if you go back to, uh, remember a couple of years ago, Ford was going to sign an agreement at CES with Waymo. Yeah, okay. They were going to, you know, develop things together. And then, I mean, Mark Fields was there. They were going to have big enough, and boom, last second, the whole thing went away. Uh, and what I'm told is that Google wanted full access to all the data. Right. And Ford said, no way in hell, because that's where the pot of gold is. Right. Meanwhile, FCA was, you bet we'll do a deal with Waymo, because they recognize they're so far behind, there's no way that they even have the deep pockets to develop this stuff. So I, I think it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis by OEM. But Gary, back to your point, if you're trying to be, bring that youth into the car buying mode, you can't pull them away from their daily routine. And their daily routine is, Apple, Android, Google, and, and, and Amazon. It's got to be in everywhere they go. So that allows seamless. the... Seam, absolutely seamless. So, so that allows the car company to sell something, mm -hmm. right? But to John's point, I mean, do you think that the OEM is going to get a piece of the action from the data? I think... Or, or, my guess is they're going to get a piece somehow. My real value is they're going to move the metal. It's another way of moving the metal. If you're trying to convince a consumer that I'm, I'm going to Uber, I'm going to share a vehicle, I'm going to do something, you're going, oh, my God, you're killing my, what, our, our bread and butter. Right. That thing with four wheels on it, how am I get into it? I need to make it seamlessly. I still think there's going to be a day where you literally bring your car. Same with Tesla. My kid, come back to my friend, his wife did not have a smartphone. She had to buy a smartphone to use the car. <laughs> She was at it. I'm never going to make this smartphone. She goes, no, I'm going to buy a smartphone just to use it because it knows when she gets in. Yeah. Right? And it's a game changer. That is ch and that's what everyone wants. If that vehicle is going to satisfy to my specific need, then they're going to move the metal. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was, talking, I was talking to a guy who works for a car company, and he, he said, you know what? We've really never been good at the ones and zeros, and mm -hmm. we probably never will be. Yeah. And... Isn't the world becoming more ones and zeros oriented? Look, the Ford Rivian is, is beautiful, right? Amazon's going to own the world, right? Just get on now. Yeah. If you're going to pit prime, <laughs> get my car here in 24 hours and, you know, your vehicle. But, I mean, they're going to own the world. Isn't but, there uh, something different than that going on at Volkswagen, though? Aren't they talking about doing the software for their cars? And I, I, I know that's probably different than, say, a communications link. But VW said something recently, it might have been at Frankfurt, that they were going to stay on top of all the software that runs in the car. In other words, you know, there'd be a big ECU running all the small ECUs in the car, and they would be in charge of writing all that software, and, and all those ones and, and zeros. And, and you know what I say? Yeah. How many German computer companies are there? Hmm. How many famous, with the exception of SAP, 
German software companies are there. So are you, are you, this is the bankruptcy of Volkswagen or? No, I'm just, I'm just saying that. I mean, <laughs> it's just like. If, you, if they don't take control of it, they're going to say, you're going to call it something. Yeah. Someone's going to get you in the end. So you had to take control of this whole situation. <laughs> well, I, but I, there, there's two sets of data here. So if Volkswagen says we're going to uh, uh, do all the software yeah. that controls all the functions in the car, guess what? Apple and Google, they don't care about that. Mm. You want to fire the injectors? You, you want to change the damping on the suspension? You go right ahead. We want the data coming in and out of the car yeah. because that's where the money is. Tolls, buying cups of coffee, all that. Oh, yeah. Even Everything knowing all. who's in the car, car where they're going, where they're stopping, yeah. what they're buying, that's where the money is. Yeah. It's yeah. not in controlling functions in the car. So Volkswagen and any other OEM will probably end up doing that. But And, and there's some things that you can learn in terms of how the car is used and how you can design it better and tracking stuff for warranty, catching it very early. But the yeah. real money is in the data going in and out of the car. So, but so again, like you, Sandy, you control was, the Sandy was calling the dinosaur parts. Yeah, the, the, the dinosaur parts. Yeah. The, the OEMs can write all the software they want all day long. Silicon Valley doesn't care about that. But, mm -hmm. but again, that software will control the pipeline from the areas that you're talking about. In other words, they'll ultimately be the gatekeeper. In other words, they will have it. They'll be able to make a decision about whether who who gets the data. But back to what Joe was saying. I mean, if 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 they're throttling Apple and Apple says, you know what, we don't want to do business with you. Yeah. Then yeah. then you're in trouble. Yeah. Then who who yeah. wins and who loses? To me, the that? four are a necessary evil for every manufacturer: the Apple, the, yeah. the Droid, mm. the uh, Amazon, the Google. Really? Yeah. I mean, it has to be. That's your consumer. And and how important do you see? I mean, as as you know, being the forecasting mm -hmm. company that you guys are. I mean. How important are those four companies to the fate of the auto industry? I mean, in five years, is is it are, are they going to be like have have seats at the table? I, I completely agree. They'll have seats at the table. They will definitely. Have, uh, that's my take, right? Amazon's the first one to take a shot at it, and you know, Bezos, he's going to make sure they build that hundred thousand vans. You know it. So over a period of years, but when you see that Prime thing moving around, you're getting your marketing, and he's selling a, a you know. You know, prime every. You know, I'm I'm giving you TV. I'm giving you saying, and I'm giving you vehicles. I'm going to come run the world. You know, Apple's got to be right around the corner. It's just like Apple saying, "I was in iTunes, and all of a sudden, all the streaming services get them." Great, we're now to iTunes, right? Never thought of iTunes would go away. Now, now we're getting streaming services, and now we're going to have Disney's going to be streaming service. Everyone's going to see that's where the next play is, and we're not going to. We're going to have 42 different streaming services at five bucks a month, paying much more than we're doing right now. But you know that's got to be in that car somehow. I guess and my question would be, will the car makers still have seats at the table? <laughs> or, will, or will those entities own the car makers? Look, the, you know, traditionally over the years, right? There was time the car makers built everything, right? Then they divested Vertical their supply chain, right? Yep. They're the brand now. They're the R&D. But they make sure their supply chain gets the job done. The stars of the world build the cars for them. So um, I think there's a day where they're just going to say, yep, we're going to have this stamp on it. It's going to have a GM stamp, and we're just... We're the consolidator. Mm -hmm. But we'll have a GM stamp or we'll have or an, an Amazon <laughs> stamp? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. I think you've got to convince the consumer <laughs> that um, they're in the car business. There was a time where they said, Apple, don't, don't ever get in the car business because right. you know nothing about cars. They said, great. But they'll get there. You can have a Ford stamp on it. It's just going to be loaded with Apple products in it. And I think they're going to let the, the doers do what they do best. And the, the nerds come in with the IT stuff and, and, and run the world from that side. So. You know, but isn't it interesting that it, it seems to me that, I mean, from the, from the four companies you mentioned, and then you could throw Facebook in as, as the fifth, um, is, is, is that basically they have done a better job in terms of getting the consumer to want to be part of their oh, yeah. Um, community yeah, Absolutely. Than, than the car companies have. Yeah. I mean, with the exceptions of, you know, Corvette owners and Mustang owners. And Teslas. And, 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 you know, I mean, but... But put Tesla to the side as as not being the unicorn. As right. It goes yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, so I mean, are, are there real fans of General Motors in terms of brand loyalty? Yeah. I don't. I honestly don't. We ask the or, question. Or, or Ford or, or FCA. I don't. Think, or, I think brand loyalty has literally gone out the window unless you work for the company you're living in place. Right. I, 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 but but does but it, does it exists for Apple. Does it exist for... Oh, absolutely, because they buy into ecosystems, so, right. right? That's Tesla is an ecosystem. Apple, Amazon, these are ecosystems. You're going to keep on bolting on the stuff. I bought a Ring 
uh, security system because I'm like, well, I'm going to just keep on bolting on this thing, right? And I'm like, oh, now Amazon owns them. Okay, I need a new piece, Amazon. You buy into the ecosystem. And I think there's not enough people buying into a Ford, GM, Chrysler, Toyota ecosystem. They're going, I need something that's going to serve my purpose. And if for some day, some comes along, it's a better purpose, Okay, that vehicle now bubbles to the top of my so list. So you see the Apple logo on the outside of the vehicle and the Ford logo under the hood. Um, I think they're going to still be the powertrain when the, when the IC is there. I don't think Apple's going to, I think the Apple's going to be in your pocket and when you plug your phone in. Yeah, it, look, I, I, there is always going to be a need for vehicle manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But who controls the, the consumer's mind and experience? And the danger will be, really, for the auto industry, if Apple decides it's going to get into ride sharing. Yeah. And maybe contract manufacture its own vehicle, design it itself. That would be interesting. But I keep coming back to this airline analogy. Mm -hmm. The manufacturers of the airlines, yeah. uh, of the airframes, make a lot of money. They're, they're very important. But the people providing the rides make way more think, money. Think about it, John. I mean, do, do most air travelers know whether they're riding on Airbus or no, Boeing? Not no. at all. They know the airline they're on. Hey, right. we're still looking to find Envision owners if they know it's come from China. So it's, uh, it, it, you know, people, they, they, they want what they want. And I think loyalty becomes la uh, not the top priority anymore, Yeah. unfortunately. Hey, look, we're going to have to wrap this up. We could go on for hours, but I want to close the show with one thing. Dale Leonard is a very loyal viewer of this show. He's in Cleveland, Ohio. He's had a throat surgery. He's had some cancer. He wrote in to say, all went well with the surgery, and my number one rated ENT surgeon saved my larynx and said the tumor was millimeters from it. So he says, I'm not calling in today because it's uh, numb and I wouldn't be able to talk. He says, but I will be watching as I cannot miss my favorite auto website. You can give me a thumbs up if you want. So, Dale, there's a thumbs up from all of us. <laughs> and with that, we're going to wrap up today's show. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Lear a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. And by DIA MTS, for advanced manufacturing machinery and lightweight components. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at autoline.tv.